Southeast Asia has been the setting of some of the most horrific acts of genocide. Two of these are the Indonesian Communist Purge from 1965 to 66 and the Cambodian Autogenocide under the Khmer Rouge from 1974 to 79. In both instances, the number of the dead play around 1 million, although it could be much higher. It should be also important to note that in both cases, artists and cultural workers were also specifically targeted. Claudia Card posits that central to the evil of genocide is social death, wherein besides the loss of life, the communal and intergenerational relationships that give life meaning are also destroyed. For Card, genocides also imply a cultural death. For this video, I will be using Card's concept of genocide and social death as a lens through which I will be examining the works of two second-generation female artists as they confront the genocides that occurred in their respective countries. I have specifically chosen female cultural workers because the disruptions of family and community, which are central to genocide's evil of social death, fall mostly heavily on women. Thus, their works are key to understanding how the arts can be a vehicle of resistance and or reconciliation in a society fractured by a horrific and violent history. Before we go into the details of the cases, it is important to clearly define genocide. Genocide is a term coined by Polish Jewish lawyer Rafael Lemkin in 1944 to refer to the systematic destruction of national and ethnic groups, including the mass murder of the European Jews. Lemkin defines it further as a coordinated plan of different actions aiming at the destruction of essential foundations of the life of national groups with the aim of annihilating the groups themselves. It is important to note that even if the term genocide is relatively new, the practice of it can be traced back to ancient times such as the Athenians' annihilation of the inhabitants of Melos in the 5th century BCE and the ravaging of Carthage by the Romans in the 146 BCE. Because genocide methodically destroys a group and a group's identity is made up of its culture, Lemkin considers the essence of genocide as cultural. This is most evident in the case of Cambodia, wherein the Khmer Rouge implemented Year Zero to reset the past and its associated culture. Card argues that social death is central to the evil of genocide, and it is what distinguishes it from the evils of other mass murders. Social vitality, which exists through relationships, contemporary and intergenerational, are what creates an identity that gives meaning to life. Thus, the loss of social vitality is a loss of identity and a loss of meaning for one's existence. The kind of harm that victims of genocide experience by virtue of their group membership is not captured by other crimes. According to Card, when a group with its cultural identity is destroyed, the survivors also lose their cultural heritage and sometimes even their intergenerational connections. In 1965, the Indonesian government gave free reign to the military and paramilitary groups to kill anyone who are considered communist. This resulted in the deaths of around 800,000 to over a million people during the period between October 1965 and March 1966. The victims included the members of the Partai Komunis Indonesia, or PKI, or the Communist Party of Indonesia, ethnic Chinese, teachers, trade unionists, civil society activists, and leftist artists. The purge occurred in retaliation to the kidnapping and killing of seven army generals by soldiers who called themselves the September 30th Movement. General Suwarto pinned the blame on the members of the PKI, although the party maintained that the coup attempt was an internal affair of the army. Nevertheless, the military, under General Suwarto's leadership, proceeded to slaughter, incarcerate and torture alleged members of the PKI and suspected communist sympathizers. The aftermath saw the fall of President Sukarno and the rise of General Suwarto as the country's next president. It is beyond the scope of this video to examine the complex events that surround the purge and the diverging interpretations of the inciting event, but suffice to say it is important to take into consideration the context of the Cold War and the United States' vested interests in the region. For further reading, I recommend Brian Miner's thesis, 1965 Communist Purge in Indonesia, U.S. Foreign Relations in Indonesia, Catherine McGregor's article, The Indonesian Killings of 1965-66, and Vincent Bevin's article, What the United States Did in Indonesia. 
Links to these works are on the description below. The anti-communist sentiment continued well after the purge. For decades afterwards, communists, alleged sympathizers, and their families have been frequently denied basic rights, such as the right to a fair trial, the right to equal opportunity in employment, and freedom from discrimination. Around 10,000 people, alleged communists or sympathizers, were detained without trial in the island of Buru in the Moluccas. On the cultural aspect, the Indonesian government under Suwarto had embarked on a choreographed national identity wherein dance practices were disembodied to construct a singular national cultural identity. The anti-communist policy that the Indonesian government adopted was instrumental in the creation of this choreographed national identity. That is, certain dance practices were banned due to their supposed affiliation with communist ideology. Furthermore, the decontextualization of the dance practices served the purpose of erasing the indigenous practices, histories, and practitioners. The cultural reconstruction undertaken afterwards also served the purpose of displacing the memory of violence and human rights abuses, thereby gaining the trust of the international community. However, it should also be noted that this process of cultural reinvention has allowed the strengthening of the resistance of subaltern identities, including the participation of female performers and their attempts at decolonization against the state and religious patriarchy. Rahmi Dia Larasati comes from a family of persecuted dancers associated with Gerwani. She is an artist scholar whose writings have explored how the repressive cultural policies enacted under Suwarto's new order have resulted in the muting of the plurality of Indonesia's cultural traditions. However, besides exploring how cultural practices can be co-opted by the state to forward their own interests, Larasati also posits that by participating in this cultural construction, the marginal groups may use the agency and space accorded by these practices in order to redefine and gain access to discourses of artistic expression beyond the national standard. On April 17, 1975, the Khmer Rouge took over Cambodia and soon enacted a radical policy that saw the resettlement of hundreds of thousands of city dwellers to the countryside in rural communes and the abolishment of modern institutions such as religion, currency, and private property. Many people were targeted for interrogation and execution by the Khmer Rouge regime, including intellectuals and suspected members of the revolutionary movement. Cultural workers, like filmmakers and actors, were viewed as being under the corrupting influence of Western culture and capitalism, and hence should be eliminated. Most of them either died under the harsh working conditions of the agricultural communes or were simply never ever seen or heard of again. An estimated 1.7 to 2.2 million people, or a quarter of the total Cambodian population at the time, were said to have died during the genocide. The cultural landscape after the autogenocide was very nearly dead as most of the country's artists and cultural workers either died, disappeared, or had fled abroad. It took decades before the country's surviving and new artists found their footing again. South of Bulikar is a Cambodian filmmaker whose mother survived the horrors of the Khmer Rouge regime. In her 2014 film, The Last Reel, she depicted the fractious relationships that exist in Cambodia today, where survivors and perpetrators live side by side and, in some instances, within the same family. The complex relationships between the survivors and perpetrators and the generation that experienced the Khmer Rouge regime and the one that came after are explored. A form of meta-narrative occurs as the film within the film helps in bridging these relationships and both the restored film in the movie and the last reel itself articulate the possibility of reconciliation. However, it should be noted that this type of reconciliation is apparatic in nature and can only be articulated in the medium of film. Of notable interest is that Lisabeth, the actress who played the mother in the film, is one of the few remaining survivors from the golden era of Khmer cinema. The cultural landscape in Indonesia and Cambodia after these acts of genocide are very distinct from each other. In Indonesia, the cultural landscape was still alive, albeit under heavy policing from the state, while in Cambodia, the landscape was very nearly dead. Nevertheless, from these situations of censorship and near decimation, cultural workers like Rahmi Dia Larasati of Indonesia and Sotha Kulikar of Cambodia rose to take up the challenge of resistance and reconciliation. 
For La Rasati, by participating in the sanctioned cultural practices, marginalized groups can use the space to redefine discourses of artistic expression beyond the national standard. Subaltern identities are finding avenues of resistance in the process of cultural reinvention, and female performers then articulate this resistance through the very act of dancing. For Kulikar, she articulates the complex relationships currently existing in contemporary Cambodian society, wherein many of the survivors live side by side with the perpetrators of the genocide. She posits the idea of an apparatic reconciliation based on irresolvable aporias. This is manifested in the scenes where some secrets are kept hidden, like Sokka's murder, in order to maintain a semblance of peace, an altogether precious commodity, especially after the horrors enacted by the Khmer Rouge regime. However, Kulikor is aware of the fraught nature of these peace and the impossibility of any future normality in the family, reflecting the current state of Cambodian society. The works of La Rasati and Kulikar show how the arts can be an instrument of resistance and or reconciliation after a horrific event wherein a significant portion of the country's population has been killed, with the perpetrators being their own countrymen. The complexity of the project of resistance and or reconciliation is further compounded by the fact that many of the survivors live side by side with the perpetrators. While hope for a peaceful restoration of the loss of social vitality may be very difficult to achieve, if not outright impossible, their works show that the arts can still be used to promote a culture of healing that, at the same time, does not forget history.